Why is Nigeria failing to reap the full gains of the big foreign exchange currency reform we saw in June that paved the way for a more than 40% devaluation of the currency? And what signal does President Tinumbu's Skondomania supplementary budget send to investors? This is the Business Day exclusive, and with me today, we have Mr. Atedor Peterside, an iconic banker and the founder of Stambik IBTC Bank and ANAP Foundation. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Great. Um, so we'll get straight to it. Um, I, I guess the obvious place to start today would be, you know, to get your thoughts on President Bola Tinumbu's supplementary budget, 2.1 trillion. Um, we saw some preliminary statistics that shows that about 5 billion naira, for instance, would be used to buy a yacht and I was wondering that um, is that really why spending at a time where over 90 percent of our revenues you know is being plowed into debt servicing what do you what do you, what do you make of this condominium budget if you like and what does this signal no, to I've, I've not gone through the budget in, in phenomenal detail but yes I've seen some highlights and I think the general criticism is a fair one from many informed observers when I say general criticism, forget about the details of one yacht or one building and the other. Fundamentally, what is the, what is the issue at stake? Nigerians believe in do as I do, not do as I say. Oh. And if Nigerians have been through hardship yeah. now, they've been through hardship b before. I can tell you something for free. I was on the economic management team under President Yeradua and the same under, under President Goodluck Jonathan. And all the feedback I got from Nigerians, especially young people who are the majority, was always, if you want to tighten your belt, our belt, that is for the rest of the people, you lead by example. Precisely. And that is a, it's a big mistake not to do that. And I, I repeat, people can endure phenomenal hardship for as long as they see the leaders making huge personal sacrifices. So it's, forget about one yacht or the other. Haven't you seen so much attention being drawn by the SUVs being bought for the Senator's House of Rep? Now, this is a country that the president says is going through an economic crisis. He met the economy in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a terrible state. Go and check the records. 12 years ago, 8 years ago, what vehicles did they buy for, for those in the legislature? I remember a time when, I think about 12 years ago, they bought Toyota Camry. So as the economy tanks and is getting worse, we are now going to more luxurious and more expensive vehicles. That's a terrible signal. Now, it's not a criticism of the president. It is the criticism of the entire legislature. And we expect at least one or two people there to show leadership. Now, if you have that mindset of exempting yourself from sacrifice, it's going to be a big problem sooner or later because people will not continue to take hardship and punishment while they see their leaders enjoying themselves. Yeah, precisely because, I mean, as you said, the reforms that the new administration has pushed through has been really painful for a lot of uh, Nigerians. It has worsened the cost of living crisis. Um, in June, we had a devaluation of the Naira, you know, that paved way for like a 40% um, depreciation in the currency, you know, and then of course the four subsidies have been taken out, even though some people would say that they've been reintroduced again. So, I mean, amid all of this, do you, do you think, I mean, it's, as you said, the, uh, the, gov the government should really practice what they preach. So do you think that the reforms might suffer any sort of setback because they're not sending the right signals as to, you know, the belt tightening that they want Nigerians to as well undergo? If, if the reforms sort of suffer a fundamental setback, in terms of people's reaction, then it will be largely traceable to the fact that the leaders did, did not show example. And it's in two broad areas. I've already mentioned the one of exempting yourself from the hardship and voting large sums of money and expenditure on, on yourself. The second one also is a bloated bureaucracy. Should you be asking people to tighten their belts when you have the largest, largest cabinet we've ever seen, most of us in our lifetimes. We've seen people going on foreign trips, a jamboree. Interestingly, those things come back to haunt you. Forget hmm. about Nigeria alone, even foreign investors. Hmm. Foreign investors were, were just about to get convinced that we have a serious government talking about a, a tackling long-standing problems like fuel subsidy 
like multiple exchange rates. Mm -hmm. What they also wanted to see was that this government was different. Mm -hmm. This government was disciplined. Mm -hmm. This government was going to also reduce the size of the bureaucracy. When you continue with the bloated bureaucracy, when you continue with voting large sums of money to yourself, when I say yourself, the ruling class, and exempting yourself from the belt tightening, you send a signal to the whole world that you are saying one thing with your lips, but by your own actions, it's business as usual. Oh. So that Nigeria, Ni Nigerian government has been known historically as being irresponsible. Mm -hmm. So you send the signal that I am one more irresponsible government. Hmm. Now, I say this early because, if anything, I think I'm doing a favor to the government. Some people will tell you the truth, and you can change your ways. And if you change your ways, everybody will see. Yeah. And will all clap for you. Precisely. But you cannot case. continue to send the signal to, to 210 million Nigerians that the belt tightening, the hardship is for them, mm -hmm. and you are exempt. Hmm. And now it's not just about bloated bureaucracy. It's also about lifestyle. Yeah. How do you carry on? You shouldn't have ministers going down the road with a fleet of multiple number of cars like emperors. All that nonsense should be cut out. I'm not going to name names, but I've seen previous, previous governments where a minister would go out. You would hardly know he or she was a minister. Yeah. At most, one police orderly. Even there was a female minister that would go around town with only one female police orderly. I spoke to her once and said, listen, I'm not against your female police female female orderly but are you sure you are safe in the event of any serious danger are you sure that she can protect you so we've gone from one extreme to the next and i think it's high time that that um, the presidency called everybody to order and also lead by example at their own end precisely okay sir, so let's talk specifically about some of the reforms now starting with the foreign exchange reforms so yes i mean a lot has happened um, there's been a devaluation of the currency you know towards a more um, if you like, market rates, um, the blacklisted 43 items, you know, that has also um, been done away with. But we're still not seeing the full gains, you know, that we'd expected, even though there was that initial um, enthusiasm, you know, and applause from investors and, you know, Nigerians. What do, you, what do you think is the missing piece of the puzzle here? I think I've already addressed it. What do investors want to see? You said we've put in place some right measures, but we've not gotten the expected investor reaction. There's no reason why investors should react immediately. Investors should look at you, watch Wait you, see. see you, look at you carefully. And if the signal you're sending to them at the same time, that is business as usual, irresponsible, bloated bureaucracy, mm. government, the government officials thinking that they're in there for luxury, mm. Mm. Then, then you're telling them that, you know, mm. these guys are preaching one thing, mm. but it's business as usual. So let's wait and see if they will get serious. Mm. So therefore, you're delaying yourself. Precisely. So that, if I hear you correctly, you mean that um, some of these things, some of these r signals, if you like, that the um, administration has been sending might even um, scuttle the expected $10 billion of inflows that we're expecting? Well, I don't know the specifics as to who is giving money, but I'm talking about I investor response. Because investor response means foreign direct investors, portfolio investors, that is different private people deciding, is this a time for me to take a bet on Nigeria? Yeah. I'm saying that but so if the government is doing things that worry them, you're, you're pronouncing the right policy measures in terms of direction, but in your personal actions and your greed, you're mm -hmm. unable to set the right tone and example, then they're going to take it that it's business as usual, yeah. which means that these Nigerians are not yet serious. Yeah. Let's wait and see if they'll get serious. Yeah. So the earlier you get serious, the better. Yeah. So I'm not linking it to any specific 10 billion or mm. 5 billion because, hey, lenders are different. Hmm. Some lenders may not look at such things. But I'm talking about investor reaction generally. But you, if you are an investor overseas and you see a government preaching the right fiscal and monetary policies, but in their personal example, they are, they are wasting resources and appear to be looking to send the signal that only the population should tighten their belt while they are exempt. Will you take that regime seriously? Oh, of course not. Exactly. And please, let's be very careful because the thing I'm going to say now, I would like to make something very clear. Un un unless my history fails me, I believe President Tinubu is the wealthiest occupant of Asso Rock. 
the wealthiest person that has become Nigerian president. I mean, talking about personal wealth at the point of entry. Because some of them might have left having looted the nation, I don't know. But at the point of entry, he's probably the wealthiest. That comes with a responsibility. And if you are wealthy coming into office, that is the more reason why you for, can, from your own office and everything around you, you can control costs. You can, you can even take, you can even, even set an example of personal sacrifice. So, so, so going to your budget, I think the budget minister, if he's not doing so, should be the one pushing and saying, no, please, Mr. President, it is particularly important that in your case, because you are a wealthy person, we don't need this. So the point I'm making is that if a poor person went into Asorok, people can argue that, well, the poor man has never seen a private jet before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He's never seen um, you know, a chance to wine and dine properly. So he wants to do so with government funds. Mm. There's nothing that is in Asorok Rock that, that is, is unaffordable for a current president. Mm -hmm. So that's the more reason why you can lead by example. Mm -hmm. You can cut out all the waste. Mm -hmm. Hey, when I say cut out the waste, I mean using federal government funds. You can use your private funds to, f to fund something, to have Why a party. Not? Nobody yeah. cares. Yeah. I think I heard in uh, Abia, the, I don't know if it's true, but the story in the media that the governor said he wouldn't even take a salary. Hmm. I'm just saying that you have many yeah. options, yeah. but it's important that you start that way. Because if you don't, the legislature will not follow suit. Precisely. Precisely. And, and it's not just them. Also, the whole government bureaucracy must get the message that we can't afford any more nonsense. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, and I'm sure many Nigerians share your sentiments as well. So, but beyond sending a signal, you know, that there's also going to be some belt tightening on the part of the government, what more do you think needs to happen for us to really <laughs> resolve the FX crisis we have on our hands? I mean, the official rates, that's from 2018, yesterday closed at 785 but the parallel market rate was around 1,170. So that still leaves a gap of about 400. We hear that um, the central bank has started to clear some of the FX backlog owed to some banks. I hear they're prioritizing the international bank with foreign clients first. But what more do you think needs to happen if we're really going to resolve the FX crisis and get the economy rolling yeah, again? Yeah, you see, when you talk about an FX crisis, it's about confidence. Hmm. Markets, do, there's no market that goes like this forever, like a rocket. Mm -hmm. Because if it did, we could all predict it mm -hmm. and we'll all become very rich. Because you can then buy here and it will get there and you can sell and you can go home laughing. Markets, even if they're moving in this direction, they will always zigzag at mm. some point. They'll zigzag because if some people believe that the worst is over, then they'll begin to take profits. So there are some natural actions that take place in the market where no single rate goes in one direction forever unless you're doing something fundamentally wrong, like the likes of Venezuela, Zimbabwe did, which means they were printing more and more local currency every day. Therefore, you are fueling the market with high-powered, well, not high-powered, but with more and more local currency. But from the monetary policy measures that have been announced, I don't think there's any intention to continue to pump, pump to print new Naira at the pace that was being done by the previous government. So, so you can say that the irresponsibility in terms of using the ways and means facility and abusing it should reduce. But beyond that, you have to now do everything that instills confidence so that people can progressively bring their own money in. Look, don't, or don't even underestimate things like diaspora remittances. Yeah. There's so many sources of, of, of revenue. Yeah. Yeah. But even diaspora remittances, <coughs> if I was in New York, working in New York, I wanted to send dollars to my family, and the exchange rate was 700, and it's racing every week, and was racing to 1,300, I can decide to wait until it gets 1,300, so that I send few, fewer dollars to achieve the same thing. Mm -hmm. So even they can get involved in wait and see. And that's why it's important that you send to everybody the signal that, we are doing everything correctly yeah. now. Yeah. And I mean everything. So there's nothing to wait for again. Mm. But if you create more and more things to wait for, mm. it's an own goal. Mm. So people should not be waiting for you to show discipline. You should be showing it from the right beginning. Yeah. 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 And please, let's also be careful because this is not about politics. No. If you look at the manifestos of the three top presidential candidates, I believe Atiku Abubakar, Pitobi, and, 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 and um, Bola Tinubu, 
all promised doing away with multiple exchange rates. They all promised doing away with the petrol subsidy. So therefore, the difference between them was not in the policy pronouncements. Yeah. The difference between them was going to come in the execution yeah. and leadership by personal example. So ask yourself, would each of these candidates mm. have gone about it the same way in terms of a bloated bureaucracy, moving around with, um, um, you know, encouraging the purchase of SUVs and yeah. all that? Please, I know about separation of powers between the executive and the legislature. But have you heard the executive complain? Have you heard the executive you know, scream at the legislature that you guys, you can't do this, you are sabotaging our effort to sell a new direction? We didn't see it, we didn't hear it, so we have to assume it was non-existence because perception matters. Hmm. If you heard, there are countries where a central bank governor and the president are at loggerheads. There are countries where the executive and the legislature are at loggerheads. If what you see in Nigeria is that they're all smiling and going home with SUVs and pronouncing huge expenditure for the in the budget, then you take it that it's a conspiracy, a gang up of the political class against everybody else. Precisely. So it's, for they, it's not for me. It's for those of them who have power that have the responsibility. They are the ones that should show that they are different and they are better. Hmm. I agree and, with you. And if they don't do that, then they delay the, the response from the, the investors yeah. who are waiting to see if yeah. it's are saying, show us that you are different. Yeah. Show us that you are better. Yeah. Show us that you understand the mistakes of the past. And every day you waste not doing that, you are delaying yourself. Precisely. Taking up from the point you just made, you know, um, mistakes of the past. So if you, if you look at, it, you also mentioned ways and means. So I was looking at the central bank data for, for June, and it showed that um, ways and means increased by $4 trillion alone in the month of June, which means that, uh, you know, the new administration has, you know, would, most likely continue to tap that source for cash because we know that they have um, challenges with revenues and then of course there's little room for extra debt. Does that give you any concern that um, we might continue to you know tap the central bank for cash? Yes I've not checked that particular number you mentioned but it doesn't matter I think we can talk about the general principle. I don't believe for one second that this government is going to be as irresponsible as Buhari's government in the, when it comes to the abuse of the ways and means facility. That's all I can say. So I don't know what the particular figure you're referring to last month showed, but even if it showed something worrisome, I imagine that they are clever and intelligent enough to understand that it cannot, they cannot continue like that. Mm. So I'm, I'm willing to believe that that kind of irresponsibility is behind us and it would have been behind us, irrespective of which of the three candidates came in. Mm. So, so I'm not therefore saying anything very flattering about Buhari's regime. Because basically I'm saying that I think they took us to the very bottom. And so, and so whoever replaced them out of the three governments was always going to be better. But that's not, that's not good enough. Because just because you're better than a terrible person does not mean you're good. We want people to be very good. Yeah. Why really lower the, the bar? But I don't want this interview to be a Buhari. I'm talking about his regime. Yeah. I'm saying that his regime, we know, in terms of economic data, was a disaster. And some of us disagreed with the central bank policy on you know, abusing ways and means, even got into exchanges in public fora in, on, on the issue of multiple exchange rates and other things they did to destroy the economy. The multiple exchange rate policy was suicidal. Hmm. You had the central bank governor largely picking winners in an economy. So the only way to win was to become his friend. And that's a disaster. So all other investors basically left. Exactly. So but where do you think the 2.1 trillion naira for the supplementary budget will come from? I, all I can say is that, again, that I believe that this government fully understands that they cannot rely on ways and means. So if they plan to borrow large sums of money, I am prepared to believe that they intend to borrow it properly. Mm. When I say borrow it properly, I mean, financing a deficit by printing money is just like fueling inflation and other things and yeah. exchange rate depreciation. Yeah. If you borrow money to spend, it's not necessarily inflationary. I'm just saying you can create it, yeah, you can course. borrow money in a manner that's not yeah. letting inflation, you're not yeah. destroying the currency. Depends on how you use it. Exactly. And not only how you use it, and also where you got the money from and on what terms. 
there was some borrowing that's available at subsidized rates to, to, to sovereign nations. So it's the clever use of those instruments. Mm. You know. Well, maybe, maybe some of the cash for the supplementary budget will come from savings from you know, ending the uh, multiple FX rates as well as taking away the petrol subsidy. But there's, there's no real saving from the petrol subsidy because we were borrowing, borrowing money to fund the subsidy. It's a mistake. Hmm. When you talk about saving from subsidy, hmm. we were borrowing money that we did not have to spend on subsidy. So if you remove the subsidy, you simply stop borrowing yeah, huge sums. As much as but there's really no, no income that has come yeah. in. You've just stopped being wasteful. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk more specifically now about the petrol subsidy removal as well. Do, do you think, um, in terms of the, I mean, like you rightly said, all three leading candidates promised to do away with it. But do you think maybe perhaps that this administration could have executed it better than, than they did? Yeah, okay, now, again, now we were saying that all three candidates promised something. Yeah. And I said the difference will come in execution. Yeah. I think it's, it's an open secret that, in terms of the announcement of the policy, very early in the day, it came as a bit of a surprise, even to some people in government. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now, there was no excuse for that, because the elections went on 25th February. There was plenty of time to put together a team, for people to discuss how they were going to handle a major policy issue like petrol subsidy. So you, you, could, have, you could have taken all your, you could have brainstormed on it, put in place arrangements to know that if you were Sorry. bringing in palliatives at what speed, if you were going to um, put, bring out safety nets for what level, and those things should have been in place simultaneously yeah. from the very beginning. Yeah. And I should also say one thing I don't like. I don't like the habit in Nigeria because I'm a businessman also, and many businessmen, some of my colleagues are, are the worst enemies of the nation. Mm. I don't like the habit each time we are discussing palliatives, each time we are discussing how to make life better for the poor. We come out with a scheme that involves voting 5 billion or 500 million or some million, largely to businessmen who are supposed to produce something that are supposed to be a palliative for the poor. Invariably, we end up subsidizing the rich businessman yeah. because we don't have the ability to monitor and ensure that whatever gains and benefits he got that comes his way from the government assistance is passed down to the um, the rank and file. So you may finish up f finding that for any of those special schemes you put aside and you disburse to the billionaires, I don't have confidence in those things. Mm -hmm. Not because you cannot make them work, but we have a poor record of making them work. So, I mean, um, the Supreme Court has affirmed the victory of, of Tinumbu. Um, what, what would you say is next now for Obi and Atiku? Honestly, they, they will have to, have to speak for themselves. <laughs> I heard that article speech. I think it was a good speech. Hmm. He said some things that some of us have been saying all along that don't make any sense. And I also pray that this government will, will find the courage to embrace electoral reform. I agree with Atiku, and he's not the only one that said it. Some of us have said it from the beginning. It does not make sense to have an election and then you, you, you proceed for litigation. In the meantime, you're swearing somebody we should change it for both governorship and the president. Have your election, allow the time for litigation, and then show in somebody properly. It's the same in Kenya, the same in many other countries. This nonsense we have benefits any government, and it actually encourages people to hijack elections. Forget about presidency and even governorship. We have Imo coming, we have Bielsa coming, we have um, Kogi coming. So any rascal knows that the thing to do is to kill everybody, break everything, snatch something, and then later on say to go to court. We shouldn't en encourage impunity. We should have regulations that say, even if you did that, it will be challenged in court, and you're not going to step into that government house as a governor until the Supreme Court has affirmed your victory. Hmm. I think that's a very important change which I would like to recommend to this government. The second one, also mentioned by Atiku. You see, we borrowed the, the American presidential system but we bastardized it in two important ways. Number one, if you look at the American election presidential system, perhaps, if, if not by design, it works partly because they only have two major parties. What that means is that if somebody be becomes US president, clearly the, he must have plenty of support around the country. 
at least close to 50 percent because sometimes with 49 percent of the popular vote you may get electoral colleges but in Nigeria's situation with multiple candidates and without having the protection of electoral colleges and and things like that you can have a situation one day where somebody only gets if there are five candidates somebody may yeah. get 25.2 percent of, of of the pop, of the popular vote and he becomes your president yeah. So I'm saying that that was not the way, I mean, that's not the way it works in America. Mm -hmm. So we, we have to think about whether this arrangement is sustainable. In many other countries, like Atiku pointed out, you, the top two candidates will go for a runoff until one person gets 50.1%. I think it's the same in Brazil. So we borrowed something and we bastardized it. And then we're living with the consequences of that. Mm. It's not that it's impossible to operate. But the chances are that if you're a president, and, and it can happen one day, two-thirds of the country don't want you, but you're the president, yeah. they will have to watch you struggle for four years as you try and convince two-thirds of the nation to support you. And let's be careful. Supporting you is a choice. It's not compulsory. People come out and say things like, well, now the Supreme Court has pronounced, everybody must accept that we go to governance. Hey, everywhere in the world there's opposition. People can decide they want to spend the next four years in the opposition. Yeah. The youth can decide that. Yeah. So it's for you in government to convince them that they should not spend the next four years in the opposition. And you will not achieve that if you don't lead by example and bring in discipline all around you. So can you see that these things are all interwoven and, yeah. and, and interconnected? Yeah. Also, my final recommendation is that even if you're in office, even if you're a governor, even if you're a president, if you want to build a broader consensus, nothing wrong in being accommodating to your opponents. Nothing wrong in saying sorry for the things that you know you did wrong. Forget about whether or not the courts found them. Not, yeah, I know I was elected president. The first thing he did was to say he was embarrassed by the way he himself was elected. And so he was going to embrace electoral reform. Even people who did not vote for him turned around and said, we love this man. But if you have to spend time gloating and saying, oh, he won an election which he knew himself was a joke and that he wants to repeat it four years from now, people who became converts and thought, oh, this man is a decent man, would have spent four years fighting him. So you make your own choices and you live with the, with the consequences of your own actions. So that's what I want to say on the subject. True, I agree. I mean, um, we, we have bastardized what we learned from, from the U.S. Uh, Tinubu now today has... Um, he was able to secure the election with 8 million votes, which is the lowest in the history of um, any president since 1999. Yeah. So let's talk about the current state of affairs in River State, uh, you know, the tussle between the current governor and the immediate past governor. Do you think um, Fubara is giving Wiki a dose of his own medicine? No, I, I, I don't have the details, but I, I only have, a, I have a, a policy. I always tell people that, you know, there's always so much information in the public space. But one has to be very careful because, I mean, 70% of it is rumors, inaccuracies, half-truths, mixed with fiction and all. So focus on the facts. And, and I place a huge emphasis on what the main actors say themselves. So if you want to form an, opi an opinion on that, I give you a hint. Mm. Watch the videos, because they're all over the place, mm -hmm. of what each of the main actors said with their own mouth. So unless they come out and disown that video, you know, can say you heard him saying this mm -hmm. or you heard him saying that. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you follow that approach, what are the facts on the table that are, that are impossible to contest? I think we saw Fubara on, on, on TV, on police, on tear gas and this and that, and he made some comments which we all saw. He, he never said to our hearing, that Governor Wiki asked him for money or any such thing. All that stuff came from other people writing or saying, follow me. F for Governor Wiki, I don't know if you've seen the video which, which was going around some time ago when he said he paid for every, every legislator, every yes. government candidate in yeah. River State and so on yeah. and so forth. Yeah, okay. So judge people on what they say. Of course. Where did that money come from? If it was his personal money, fine. Hmm. If it is state resources, foul. In any case, if it is state resources and you did it, should you be announcing and broadcasting it? Hmm. What is the purpose of that kind of statement? Is it to intimidate 
those who are in office, that you paid for them to get into office. When Goodluck Jonathan became president, I was one of the speakers at a ministerial retreat. And one of the things I told the ministers then, they thought I came to talk about the economy, was that, listen, it does not matter how you got into the cabinet. From the minute you're inside the cabinet, some rules apply. Number one, you have only one boss, that's the president. And number two, your responsibility is to doing the best you can for Nigeria. So reminding people about who helped them get elected and, and, and what of you might be relevant for your own ego. But I think I would like to remind all those people and everybody in Nigeria, not just River State, I forget about how you got elected. Perhaps God knows why he got you elected in a particular way. Now that you are in there, you use your position, you use, do what you think is the right thing for Nigeria and Nigerians. Otherwise, you can spend the rest of your four years or the rest of your life beholding to somebody else, and then you fail. I'm not as preaching. If you notice, I'm talking generally. It's not even about River yeah. State. Yeah. There will be other elected persons whom somebody helped to get. Look, every minister usually got appointed because somebody recommended them. Hmm. Are you going to spend the next four years you know, paying homage to the person, person who recommended you? Better focus on being a successful minister. Yeah, that's a distraction, yeah. The, the fact is that if you're a minister today, President Tinubu appointed you. Mm -hmm. Forget about some godfather that put you there. Focus on delivering for Nigerians. Hmm. Because at the end of the day, your, your, your own legacy is based on what you delivered for precisely, Nigerians. Precisely. It's not based on some godfather that put you there. Precisely, I agree with you, sir. So I'm not talking about wiki, I'm talking about yeah. the general principle. Yeah, and I people see, should please stop point. going around reminding everybody about who they put into office and all that nonsense. Mm -hmm. If you put somebody in office, then keep quiet and let the person perform. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. he's not doing very well, then call him privately and talk to him. Don't mm -hmm. come and broadcast to us mm -hmm. that you put him in office and all that. Mm -hmm. We don't need that. We don't, we, I mean, we, we don't want to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, Wike himself now is uh, Minister of the FCT. Um, talking more broadly about um, Tinubu's team now, do you think the team is primed enough to deliver for Nigerians? And do you think he kept to his word to make appointments based on merit and not politics? No, I don't want to go into details of individuals, but I think I've made a general point as to the early warning signs that I've seen in the area of areas of um, bloated bureaucracy, running business as if it's as business as usual, not setting an example for belt tightening. As for the composition of the team, the important thing is that I said earlier that look. Is the budget minister just collecting every demand and putting in the budget? Together. Or is, or is, he, he, is things, he saying, right? hang on a second, ladies and gentlemen, we're not here to do business as usual. I don't want to be embarrassed by putting things in the, in the budget proposal that, that sound wasteful at a time like this. Those are things that they should be discussing in cabinet. Hmm. I'm not part of them, so they can, I mean, I'm not, I'm just, we're just talking generally here. Yeah. It is important to send the right signals to Nigerians. Yeah. But they are going to be part of the sacrifice. Yeah. All right, I'll ask my final question. What are the chances today for a 33-year-old to replicate the feat you did in 1989 in setting up IBTC Bank? Yeah, okay, first of all, the, it was possible then because the rules allowed it. And the rules then were said to be a bank CEO who needed 10 years of working experience, mm. banking experience. So I started working at 22 in the bank. So by... so. By 32, I had 10 years' experience and was qualified. Sadly, the rules today won't allow somebody my age because instead of 10 years, it was increased to 20 some years ago. And then later, I think now it's 15 years. So if you take 15, if you, have, if you need 15 years' experience, then even if you started work at 22 like I did, that takes you much later. But you see, but that whole principle of constantly um, raising the bar in terms of what age you need to get to, how many years experience you need for something. It's something that the youth should keep on fighting and, and resisting. Hmm. Because as you can see from what we've described now, when I was a younger person, we were allowed to do more things, 10 years, five years qualified you. But progressively, as people got older, selfish people started prolonging the minimum requirements. Not because there was any evidence that the youths were bad, but sometimes, you know, as people got older, they just felt that only their generation should get involved in something. 
and there's no pushback from the youth. They'll continue that process. So it's, it's something, that's why I said before that the society has, in various ways has been rigged against the youth. Take also at the beginning of this whole attempt to, um, to, to elect democratic governments. Some people sat down in Abuja and started deciding that to be in the House of Rep, you must be at least this age or the other age. You must be, you must be 30, you must be senator, you must be. And generally, a bunch of old people sit down. They look at themselves and they start putting all these, these things that bar younger people from taking part. Why do you need to be, I mean, sorry, I, I, want to, I don't want to sound disrespectful, but let me sound, put it in a positive way. There are many young people today in economics. They know more economics than the, than the old men put together. You go to many, many disciplines, there are young Nigerians that are more competent. If you bring them into a room to take, to grill them, interview them, you will hire them before half the old men out there. Mm -hmm. So why do you want to constantly have situations where you, 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 you shut the door on them? On the Buhari himself, take our last president, Buhari, he was the minister in his, in, his, in, his, in his 30s. His first cabinet, I think the youngest person was 50. So is he saying that after he got in there in his 30s, that today's 30-year-olds are mm. not better than him mm. or as good as him? Mm. Hmm. So that's the point I'm making. That and, and as a society, you get what you accept sometimes. If you reject such things and speak yeah. out against them, people will now tone yeah. down. Yeah. That's why you got this movement that people started saying, not too young to run. Yeah. Started questioning that. Why should a 24 year old not be allowed to do this or do yeah. the other? Look at other countries. Young people are in very high positions. Yeah. And the young people in Nigeria should progressively demand that. Yeah. If you don't demand your rights, they won't hand them to you. Hmm. But how exactly can they do that? You know, push for that. Yes, but um, in fairness to them, they have been more and more vocal. Yeah. They have become more politically active. All that was important because, like I said, change doesn't always come on a plate. It's because many young people became politically have progressively become politically active, especially in the last last four years. Forget about whatever name you call them. The fact is that they got their PVCs. Mm -hmm. They are interested. If you, follow, if you follow the chatter on the internet and all that, they became a major force because they showed, they showed that they were interested in their country and its destiny. And it begins to influence people. It influences minds. I mean, you can define success in different ways, but I think it's important that there's an army of young, educated people out there fighting for their rights in whatever forum they, you know, they, they have or are able to organize and making themselves heard. And they should continue even with this government. You know, there's no reason to stop. Precisely. One or two token appointments of young people that have been done by this government should not be reason for you to relax. You should be demanding more all the time. Yeah. Please, I'm not saying this because have anything against old people. Mm. I'm saying it because we have very many young, competent people in the country who should be occupying well, yeah. higher positions and bringing new ideas. Yeah. And they probably do a better job. Yeah. Thank you, sir. We'll do better. Thank you so much, sir, for your time. It's a pleasure interviewing you. This is where we call it a day on today's episode. Feel free to join in the conversation in the comments section. And don't forget to follow us across our multiple social media platforms. I'm Lolade, and this is the Business Day Exclusive. Till next time, thank you.